has like its introduction is basically a list of here's the things you need to know before you start the rest of the grind. And it matches up almost perfectly with what Silver says are like his principles and what you need to know. And then there is a continuous line throughout the three manuscripts between Harvey, which is the earliest one, and Silver, which is the latest, that talks about two main stories. So we can be confident that somebody who practiced English long story in the 1380s would have looked at George, somebody who learned from George Silver, if anybody did, um, practicing for him story and been like, oh yeah, I recognize that. That dealt with what I know. The cool thing, the super cool thing for me, uh, is that this is in a transitional harness period, which is, if you're an armor dwarf, you know that that's the point at which they started adding plate. But it wasn't full harness like you see in like Paul Hopper uh, or anything earlier. Uh, not like a full head to toe type of piece, like there's no use in hitting it to a sword, basically just go to half sword and start jabbing with the, the arm and throwing your face. It is written at a time when it is still sort of okay to hit people in armor with the edge of the sword because it wasn't guaranteed to help you plate. And in fact, the most common body of armor was this coat of plate at the time, so it wasn't exactly true against long sword, which means we have this super cool transitional arc that comes between they were first trying to use two-handed sword uh, and nail and the full-on plate harness of like the early 1400s. So that a lot of times you're like, well, why would you bother doing this uh, if you're in armor? Because it wasn't protecting the same places. Or conversely, if you're saying, well, they're wearing armor, you know, or you know, why why am I swinging my sword around like this? It's because you're wearing armor, but it's just a tiny little bit more momentum, more momentum. Um, and I promise that's actually true because I did get like some nice harness and try this stuff and I was like, oh yeah, like it is real hard to like just stop and reverse momentum as opposed to moving around. So here's what this is. This is a brief introduction to the principles and some of the combat combinations and the cool sexy stuff for English long story. It's kind of like a case study. Um, what it is not is like a in-depth, long look at all the basics. Because if you want that, you can read George Silver. Not, unfortunately, English doesn't have pages and hours. It doesn't have somebody who said, here's exactly what you need to do, and then spawned a tradition after that. It doesn't have a Dave Newbery who uh, basically has pretty much forgotten after a generation. But you know, he wrote down like some really big deal that people were able to look at after. It basically just has a bunch of notes left by students, and then like one person who wrote a an overarching transcript of here's what you should do in this situation now. What that means that a lot of the time, and I'm, I love answering questions, but a lot of the time the answer to the question is we don't know, uh, or there's not enough documentation for that, or here's my best guess. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope. <laughs> so, um, when we talk about the long story in English, um, we've got lots and lots of iconographic evidence, uh, which suggests it's pretty much the same as on the continent, with one kind of weird exception, which is that um, especially if you look at the uh, the Pondasi and the pseudo Pondasi, and they've got like these big swords that come up to like their armpits. Um, that seems to have been pretty popular in Germany. In English, they liked fighting on foot. They liked it a lot to the point to, to the point that when they were going over to France and like engaging their ill advised war of conquest over there, they were famous for like riding up to the battle, doing the eight charge, and being like, okay, okay, we did the work stuff. Everybody off. Um, and then like, you know, getting off in their full plate. They love them some tall axe and they love their long sword. Uh, which means that their sword had to be short enough that they could be a full harness, have this on a knightly belt, and it's not going to get in the way. Which means even their long sword, the blade, is basically going to be about the length of their leg. Uh, plus enough for two hands. Silver says the same thing, weirdly enough, like hundreds, literally hundreds of years later. He says the length of your sword should be such that you can draw back your arm without opening its elbow joint, and you can still reach in front of it and hold a dagger. Um, now, he's saying that because he hates uh, the Italians with like a ridiculous, like, hard-on pattern. Um, but he hates the fact that they've got these long, long rapiers. Um, like, so Capo Ferro is talking about how he's got like, these long rapiers that you can get to reach. Um, Silver's like, no, no, no. Like, if you do that, then you can't come across in time. But really, what he's also doing is he's sort of uh, backstage. He's coming up with a modern explanation for the tradition that he was part of.
talk with you relatively short way for a long story, plus uh, a grid, which by the tutor era they would start to call it bachelor story. So when we teach our classes about tutor stuff, we call it bachelor story. When we teach about the early, uh, the late medieval stuff, we usually talk about long story. So that's enough talking out of the resources for the moment. Any questions about where this comes from? Indeed. Now let's get to movement. Um, the first thing um, that you should know is that most of the movements are very similar to what you'll see in Italian or German or Iberian because there's really only so many ways you can move like a four foot bar and start with a um, You know, so there's, there's differences in the decisions that are made, there's differences in the distances, but the actual movements are pretty similar. So for example, we have what's called the hawk, which is basically just an overhaul. Right? We've got the supporter, which is basically just a storm column. Uh, we've got a uh, single quarter, which cuts into a hanging house, a storm house that cuts into a hanging. And if I do a quarter or a uh, horn horn into the quarter, that's basically just a storm house horn. Right? So it's a lot of very similar stuff. However, the decisions that get you there and the way that you move between positions is what makes it cool. So the first thing we're going to learn is uh, movement called the rate, because that is the one thing that I consistently do when I go to like tournaments and uh, different sorts of events um, or things like WMW. And people are like, oh, what was that? Because I'm sure that other people have this. I suspect they thought it was too big to be bothered writing it down. Um, so this is an attack of opportunity for all you D&D nerds out there. This is basically, um, so rate, um, in Middle English, it was a couple of things. When a hawk would let to, let to fly in a circle, and it's searching for something, um, and then if someone saw something, it would go along the ground. That was called raking. Um, rake also obviously is like, you know, raking up leaves, you know, pulling towards you. Um, it also was a 15th century dance step, um, which was a, an offline sort of step. And um, it meant an untrustworthy character, kind of like a crook, right? The crook was an untrustworthy character in like 15th century German literature. So it's a similar thing where they're like, well, we're going to name this after several things that it all matches. So the rate starts out, it's got a couple forms, but the one that's easiest to learn is we start down here in a full guard, essentially, and we reach out with our right hand. Thank you. 
visualize the stuff we're going to do later on. So, just a couple more. Have a look at the downward version, which is super cool as well. You see this uh, stuff in the armor stuff, but it really starts coming down the back and forth that they're not wearing armor, uh, and they're a lot more naval armor. Cool, so we've got the Nazi rate upward, as uh, Harley and Nick Chris would say. We've also got a rate downward, which is the same sort of movement, the same sort of mechanics, but you start in like this uh, spoof sort of stance. Uh, and you just reach out with your right hand and let it drop with your left hand, pulls the pommel up, and so now it's really what you mean like a snap cut, where you're just swinging out and doing this. Here's where this is actually useful as a counter. Um, Alright, so David has decided that he's going to uh, thrust him, and now he's moving against me. This is my counterattack so I can come back up with his head. So the benefit of this, right, is that if, if he pushes in and I push down, I'm expending a lot of energy, and I'm putting these biomechanics all in this point, which means if he has any sort of sorcery at all, as soon as I push down, he's going to give me something terrible to think about by coming around to my head and just, yeah. Yeah, there we go. I'm just going to push down and he's going to follow the momentum and bad things are going to happen to me, right? So the benefit of this is I'm not expending my energy biomechanically. I'm pushing the wrist so that when he uh, thrusts, I'm there. And if he comes around, I'm not lying spent down here. I'm still basically in a hang, right? So that if he comes around, I can either walk that way or he makes a wide compass and comes around that way. It's a very short line for me to walk this here. So, once again, I'm going to do this with the displacement, or with the sidestep tension. Um, with the sidestep, because the expectation is this, he's not just a one hit wonder, right? He's not going to trust at me and be like, what? I mean, that didn't work. I've got nothing else. That always works. Um, so, when your opponent trusts, then this is the time to push down so that you're getting kind of like a scissoring uh, motion on the blade, clicking along the very uh, 133 sort of floating buckler kind of pushing along the blade, and you don't want to go much lower than just parallel to the ground, uh, because you want to be able to recover quickly. So, a couple of those, actually my favorite version. Well, the English used to be like, you told the Portuguese, like back in the 1340s, 
problem with it. They came out of nowhere with like this amazing military might and pulled over all of France. He used to be the top dog in Europe. Um, and then they went down to Italy and started right to stop there because Italy was busy stabbing each other in the back and poisoning each other. And they were just like, maybe we can make money off this. So the English were very much, their style was wait and see, but once you've got the advantage, carry it through. Uh, which means that they were totally okay with staying out of Italy going, snap, okay, go fight it. Snap, snap, there we go. Now he's bleeding and he's having trouble holding the sword. Me, the next one I'm going to brush in and I'm going to start breaking the bones. Uh, but what you'll see is that English distance tends to be a little wider than, I, at least, and this is going to, I'm making this assumption based on the way I've seen people fight over the, over the years, but it tends to be a little bit wider than I see uh, people who practice like Army Sare or Kunta Setsu, uh, because both of those start out and they say, um, what's going on? Sam? Sam? All right, so Sam, we're, we're going to do like a good old KDS match, right? What am I looking for? What's the first thing I want to get so I can know where your sword is? Heal, right? How do I get free Yeah, and I've got to get the bind, right? I need the bind. The English don't want the bind. If you're in the bind in the English system, something's gone wrong. Right? You're too close. What the English want is, you're trying to get the bind, you know, and you're extending, and I'm going down. Don't do that. Right? Don't do that. No, stop that. Don't do that. Okay. Right? What they want is, now they do say eventually bind together. Uh, what they do say eventually um, is, they do want to bind you together, but do it to your advantage, which means be aware of your space. Um, we do this whole thing uh, for our novice class, and we start out and say, okay, so, stand as far away as the teacher can go to hit this guy. Um, and then we make him back up a little more and say, okay, now back up a little more, back up a little more. And people find that they can still hit somebody from a marvelously far distance away, as long as they're willing to sacrifice time. But if you know that you can be hit from just forever away, what's your name? Gary. Gary? Okay, so, Gary, can I hit you from here? Uh, yeah. Okay, right. Like, if I'm taking normal steps, I'm, I've just missed it. But I can take what the, uh, the English call the great step, move my hand first, and really get in there. And now I'm like overshot, right? I'm like at least two hand spans closer than I need to be. Which means that our engagement distance in English is usually about here when we start. This is what they call the far. In a stunning uh, display of imagination, they had two distances, the far and the near. <laughs> Um, so, thank you, Gary. Um, so, we've got our far, we've got our near, and the biggest difference I think you'll find in the tactical expression of this system and these principles is that the English like to start in the far, and they like to keep it there for as long as they can until they have a definitive advantage, what George Silver would call the place with a capital T. So, um, I'm going to show you the third break, which is super cool. Um, which is part of what we call double breaks. So the English love them some doubles, and they like circles. There are big believers in platonic theory, which is this idea that circle motion is the most perfect motion. Um, Socratic theory was big on that as well. So, or excuse me, Aristotelian. Um, then, so then they rediscovered Socrates in the 1500s and everything. But they like circles, which means a lot of the attacks we'll look at and combinations we'll look at are based on circular motion. Um, one of our principles we tell our students is, a line repeats a circle, and a circle repeats a line. Which means if your opponent is moving in a linear fashion, you move in a circular fashion. If they're moving in a circular fashion, you move in a linear fashion to cut off their arm. So when we're doing these breaks, we're not just going to go snap and hit once. We're going to go snap, snap. Um, so the third one is this uh, true edge break from below. It's kind of a mix between uh, like a shin and a uh, super hop. So we're going to start from low. Uh, and we're going to turn our hands over, almost in like this uh, kind of vaguely screwed up trunk uh, position. Uh, and we're going to flip the hip up. What I, what are, what are, what's my opponent aiming for if he's doing a rake on me? Hands, right? More aiming than targets. Generally, my hands. Which means if I'm fighting Ben and I start here, and he's in a screw, um, and he knows to do the same sort of thing too. If I do this, what's he going to do? He's going to punish me for my idiot presumption, right? So when I do this, I have to flip the hip first and then follow in the next, which means the blade always has to move. And I know that this is super 
communication stuff, and I'm not trying to talk down to you. The way that we have to move before is when even when you are doing these, these great things there. Um, when you're doing these great, it's really easy to get the idea that I'm moving my hand forward and then clicking. If I do that, I'm exposing my hand to danger. Um, so you want to think of this almost like 133 sword and buckler, right? The sword must protect the hand. So the sword's going to lead the hand to these dangers. The hands aren't going to lead the sword because then it's backwards. It's going to be hard to pull the So you want to flip up. Sorry for the So we're going to flip up and we're going to draw back into a uh, middle guard or the uh, uh, So starting from like this kind of flipped over uh, concrete, flipping up and then pulling back. Now that on its own is kind of slow, but when you get the momentum, and my first most favorite exercise here to do this, then you can really start getting this kind of spiral motion to it. You start with a race, and then you drop the stick, flip it out, and pull it here, which means you can do these double races for low target, high target. Um, so, there's our first drill that we're going to do, and it's just a movement drill. I promise we'll be each other. Uh, but uh, the first drill we're doing is a movement drill. It does not matter which way you have forward to begin with. Yep. Uh, because each time you're going to take one of these uh, triangle steps to reposition yourself. So you're always trying to mess up forward. Uh, that's just happening. Um, that's, that's because platonically, left foot forward is the way to succeed in the manuscript, and it ends by setting in the right foot. But that's just because they're presenting it in this like, platonic fashion or like this. The most perfect way to do it, then you can also do it all the other way. But they don't say that. So you can also do it right foot forward, flick it, flick it. So if you are ready to go forward, it's the same fashion here on the other side. Correct. Um, rarely, rarely are you going to do that. Um, there's exceptions when you get into Paul well, Allen, but, yeah. but rarely. As, as well. Right. So our drill is going to be flick with the flick with just the uh, false edge race. Don't move your feet yet. Flick the true edge up into uh, off. And then when you're there, drop the sword down into the, like, the tail guard. Flick up. What you'll get is this continuous motion drill. You keep it in the arm. Don't let your elbows start to pop out. Because the English loves them hitting some elbows. The phrase smite no hit elbows is heard something like six or seven times. Which doesn't seem like a lot, but for a little the, for as little text as we have, that's actually a huge proportion. So don't let your elbows pop out. Try to keep them relatively close. Um, even in armor, getting drilled uh, with sharp sword and elbows sucks. Um, so keep that in mind. So nice and slow, get the movement first. Get the, the, the hip flicking out first. And then let the foot follow.